Jesus triggered everyone. That's why on the day he died, they said, crucify him. He did nothing wrong. They just, they just got triggered. He knew she was innocent. They triggered him, then they killed him. I don't care if things trigger you. Be triggered. Tell your Bible, it's still John chapter 6. John chapter 6. The title of sermon today is this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? You know, I've been a disciple for, for five years right now. And being a disciple for five years, I've had my fair share of hard teachings. You know, one time when I was working in, in Harrods, you know, for those who are from London, there's only, there was only one main Harrods where they had a helipad on the roof, where the most expensive perfume was 800k. That, and I saw Simon Cowell two, three times, David Williams two, three times. Share, almost share my faith with Javel McGee. So I, am a, I dare we say it's like the rich person's Tesco. <laughs> but I had my fair share of our teachings. Why do I mention Harrods? When I used to work in Harrods, I used to be a salesman. Right? And being a salesman, I mean, it's a very deceitful industry right there, sometimes just to get the sale. But what's the point? What's the point? At that time when I was working back in 2019, I lost my phone three times. No, no, I lost my phone three times. The first time was when it was raining on a Friday evening. And what happened that evening? Campus devotional. And it was an encouragement devo. So as I was making my way to go to the encouragement devo, you know when your earphones go like, didn't? For those who have it, news, I'm like, I was like, why did you just do that? Because it was raining, I had to take my umbrella out. I checked my pockets, my phone was gone. I tried to backtrack my steps in the rain, so desperate to look for my phone, but I couldn't find it. And I still had to drag myself all the way to campus devotional because just because I lose something doesn't mean it's, it gives me an excuse to list meetings of the body. Because sometimes, you know, I can find myself being so concerned about losing my phone, deeper convictions about losing my phone, than losing my convictions. We evangelize when we lose our phone. Hey, where's my phone? You preach the word. Where's my phone? Does that, has anybody seen my phone? Just imagine if you were like that for the lost. Does everybody know about the gospel? I'm unashamed about my faith. I'm going to look for you, someone until I find them. I'm going to seek for a lost soul until I find them. How come I'm more committed with about losing a phone? I'm going to find my phone until I find it. You find a replacement. You're so desperate to find a replacement. Wow. Rather than find another person you can see in the kingdom of God. But again, losing my phone the first time. But what happened ironically? I got to the campus devotional and I ended up winning king of encouragement. I didn't allow anything to steal my joy. And then ironically what ended up happening, my phone got found in Shoreditch, which is far away from Oxford Circus. I'm like, how did my phone end up in, uh, in Shoreditch? But then of course I, I got my phone back, the same phone. That was the first time. Then the second time, what ended up the second time? The second time was after I met some, of you guys know, Sulu Chan. So that day I was supposed to go to a doctor's appointment, but I felt quite well. I was like, okay, you know what? I see this guy, he looks like a model. Let me share with him. And then he ended up being Sula Chan. He had his Bible in his bag. So he ended up doing a, a, an on-the-spot Bible study. He went to the nearest McDonald's. Amen. Right? And so when we got to this McDonald's, uh, someone was uh, talking about uh, some map. They, they came to us and said, hey, can you help me find this area in London? They took the map, hid my phone behind it while me and Sula were taking out our Bibles from our bags and took the phone after I showed them where the map is. And then the employers of McDonald's came upstairs saying, hey, check your pockets. They are thieves. We're kicking them out. They're these people, they were, they, were, they, were, they, were basically, they were basically thieves, right? And so I checked my phone, it was gone. 
And so I literally had to tell Sulo, Sulo, watch my stuff. And that was the first time we met. I had to trust a random guy I just met with my stuff so I can go chase after my phone. So then he was like, yeah, don't worry, I got you. I came out the store, I saw the lady running. I was like, give me back my phone. And she was like, I was like, hmm. <laughs> took out my phone and ended up, Sula Chan ended up becoming a disciple. Yeah. But then the third time, you could think at this point, I'm a bit clumsy at this point. Right? The third time I had to take some medication because I had something wrong with my finger. Right? Uh, so I'm not going to go into details what happened to my finger. Right? But what's the point? I had to take medication every six hours. And if I didn't have my cupboards by a certain time, like when, when you got, basically, when you got to the workplace in the morning, you have cupboards designated to you. But you have other employers trying to take those cupboards as well. So once it's taken, there are open cupboards. That means anyone can just put their stuff in and take them out, anybody's stuff. So I, I didn't have any space for the closed cupboards, so I put them in the open cupboards. And of course I had to take medication every six hours and on my phone there was an alarm. So I left my phone inside my bag in the open cupboard. And so, because you weren't allowed to take your phone out on the, on the, on the cell floor. So when I came back to my, to my cupboard, my phone was no longer there. Because, of course, I was like, oh, no. My alarm probably went off. Someone went into my bag, probably took my phone with them. I went to find my iPhone, and it said that they lost connection just outside my workplace. Oh. That means they took it, they took my SIM card out, everything. Wow. That was the third time I lost my phone. So I had my fair share of hard teachings. Mm. I had to let go of my phone and latch on to God. Mm. Amen. That the strongest connection you can ever have is never a connection with your phone. Mm. Right. Or even connection in a relationship. Yes. Right. The strongest connection that you can have is with Abba Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And then another time, hard teachings never stop. <laughs> One time, you know, I was, on, I was on a bulk, right? When I was bulking up uh, to uh, go into the gym. And some people know my old diet. I was having a whole packet of pasta and some tuna and mayonnaise. And some salt and... Okay, anyways. <laughs> What I do, I eat the whole thing in a day for just dinner. For just dinner. I was, I was, I was eating like 3,000, 4,000 calories. I gained around 20 kilograms in the span of three months, uh, no, in the span of year, a year. 20 kilograms, right? I could have been blown by this wind, you know, a few years ago. But what's the point? One night, it was at 1 a.m. I don't know why it was 1 a.m. What I was doing up at 1 a.m. Trying to make some of this pasta. And you know when you open the tin can? And you know the sharp edge? Yeah. I tried to scoop out the tuna. I didn't know, I didn't notice that the edge was leaning on my finger. So when I did this, yeah, you can imagine what happened next. And I, I looked at, for me, I didn't, re I didn't respond immediately. You know when you look at it, you just process, you're like, what did I just do? <laughs> and then I'm like, it was 1 a.m. Ah! I was like, ah, Frank! This is when Frank was still in the house. And he came out of bed like this. Oh my goodness. And I was just like, Frank! Oh and he was like, he was, and he was like, oh, don't worry bro, I got a plaster. And I literally had to just wash my, my finger underneath water. And I still have the scar, the, the scars here actually. Um, and so, the whole time when I was waiting for the plaster, I was like, God, what are you trying to teach me? In this, what are you trying to teach me? You know those moments in, your, in, in, in discipleship where you're just like, God, what in the world are you trying to teach me? And so I'm not going to, you know, obviously, amen, my finger ended up getting, you know, healed right there. But the point is, is that there are a lot of hard teachings in our lives. Right. Recently, I've been learning a lot. I've learned so much about myself in the past few months leaving the church. Come on, marriage. I learned a lot about, we started, Novella and I started marriage counseling. Because me and Novella are getting married, new date, September the 16th. It's confirmed. You know, I learned something, you know, in marriage counseling. You got to share everything. No, I said, you've got to share everything. everything. You've got to share everything. Yeah. So in the marriage counseling, I was told, bro, I know you want this amount of protein. But when, he got, when, when, when Frank got married, he was like, yep, I can no longer hit my protein intake because oh, your wife's going to be like, that's, oh. that's nice food you got there. It's basically a smoke single si signal saying, I'm hungry. Yeah. Yeah. So then I have to go, give her my portion. And go make another portion for me. And if she still wants more food for my plate, I'm like, Jesus, Lord, you can have more. Watch how much you eat, but I'm going to help you out. But share everything. 
Share everything. I won't be in this. I won't be able to lay in my bed like this anymore. <laughs> but another thing I'm learning in, in marriage, I got we gotta be worshipful. Worshipful. Nothing can steal our worship. We gotta pray. We gotta be spiritual. Marriage has gotta be spiritual. God is teaching me a lot about my character. A lot of lack of integrity, humility, and gratitude. This is what God's trying to teach me at this moment. Hard teachings. And God would teach, even if it wasn't directly to me. But it can be towards something that I care about. May even not, it may even happen to you. Where something doesn't even happen to you directly. But it happens to something that you care about. He won't even allow it to maybe happen to you. But something that you care about. Like Pharaoh. The ten plagues. It didn't happen to Pharaoh. But it happened to his people. Happened to his son. Only just to let God's people, Israel, go. Ten plagues. Imagine getting humbled ten times. And you're never humbled. You're like, what? Man. Man, I feel like God's got on my side. Wow, God, God is really on my side. But I've got no job, got no money. But no, I'm, 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 I'm fine. I've got no disease. But then the ten plagues. It took the ten. It took the tenth one, with Pharaoh's son, for him to change. What's it going to take for you? Because when God te- decides to teach us a type of way, sometimes we can get an attitude. Yeah, what he teaches you just exposes what's already there. It's like two sponges. You squeeze one sponge, you don't know what, what, where's water unless you apply pressure. Pressure is a good thing. Pressure is of God. Yes. Pressure is of, of God. Stresses are of Satan. Amen. You know, what, teaches, well, what gets exposed was, has always been there. Maybe God's trying to squeeze that out of your character. Because for me, I've always had a lack of integrity. I apply for university late, apply for college late, apply for work late, apply, I do sermons late. To, did the wedding late did everything late but God decided through ICCM to expose it the most bro you might get kicked off the program because of your lateness so my character has always been there but God's like I'm going to decide what area to expose it the most you know in John 6 at this point Jesus was getting viral so many people were looking for him his following increased This was following the events of the feeding of the 5,000 and walking on water. And many were looking for him. Though those looking for him weren't really looking for God. They weren't looking for him. They were just looking to get their needs met. They're like, oh, we got fed the 5,000. We got fed food. I want to go follow him again to get my needs met again. I'm only going to go to God when I want something. What does that look like? As long as you give me a husband, God, I'll follow you. As long as you give me life insurance in the kingdom, God, I'll follow you. As long as I don't get kicked out the church, because you can't get kicked out the church unless you're in sin. Unless I'm surrounded by people who are nice to me, but then I control them emotionally, I'll follow you, God. As long as I get to compromise some of my convictions, I'll follow you, God. I'll just create a new denomination in Christianity. That's what they were following Jesus for in John 6. Right. We're only fo- they were only following him because of the things they could give. The, the things they could get from him. Right. They followed him with the wrong motives. Question, I want to ask you this today. Why are you following Jesus? Why are you here? Why are you following Jesus? Why are you following Jesus? Why are you here? Why are you in the kingdom? Are you taking up space? For someone else who actually shared the faith. Why are you here? There's so many other churches you can choose from. This is not pick and mix Christianity. Mm. Being a disciple. I, I want to bring something to light. Being a disciple doesn't mean all your problems go away. Mm. We live in a fallen world. Yes. There's no such thing as a perfect church. There will never be no hypocrisy. No mistakes. No sin. It will never be perfect. You're describing an impossible thing. If you're looking for the perfect church, you'll never find it because you're in it. You're trying to be part of this perfect church? You're not perfect. And you find, if you find a teaching hard to accept, God will teach you the same lesson, just different intensities. 
until you get the lesson. I'll get into why people feel stuck. You may feel stuck because you haven't got the lesson. Again, just like Pharaoh with the 10 plagues. He didn't go after, imagine, after one plague you change. 10? But the scripture says he won't give you more than you can bear. So he knows you can handle what you have. First Corinthians 10, 13. And yet he tells these people in, in John chapter 6 that they need not come to him for their needs to be met by eating the physical bread for their satisfaction, but instead by eating the word of God, the spiritual bread, his flesh, his blood. Amen? Amen. John 6. Hope you guys are with me. Yeah. Verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? What is powerful is that Jesus is talking to those who are already following him. So it's biblical for Jesus to teach hard teachings to those who are already following him. And what does the scripture say? The scripture says many of his disciples, which means it wasn't just one. It was many. The disciples were all unified on disagreement. They were unified on, man, I don't like what Jesus said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like what, yeah, I don't like what he's saying too. They become so unified. They become unified in their gossip rather than a Bible study. They fo- you know what they did? They formed a clique against their preacher. Preach. Come on, preach, bro. If this was in Jesus' movement, how much more said it so today? Yeah. Yet despite the fact that Jesus was addressing the crowd, preaching to the lost initially, it was the disciples who were finding the teachings hard to accept. Wow. It wasn't even the lost. It was the disciples. Wow. The message offended them. Despite the fact it wasn't directed to them. It just exposed them. The scripture states, we're being made perfect. We're being made holy. We're being made more Christ-like. Things happen to expose the un-Christ-like in us. To be a Christian, what does Christian mean? Christ-like. We call ourselves, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Are you responding like Christ? Do we speak like Jesus? Do we respond like Jesus? Now we're not, we're not Jesus, but we're like Jesus. Do we act like Jesus? Do we have a relationship with one another like Jesus? Do we have this? The Bible says in Philippians 2 verse 5, in your relationships have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Would Jesus be saying the things you're saying in your relationship with disciples? Would he be saying that? Would he? Do we have presence in a room like Jesus? Wow. Because not just the leaders who are Jesus, it's wow. disciples. Yep. Some disciples I don't even say, don't even say hi to me when I come in. Don't. I'm not Jesus. Come on, call it out. But the Bible says how you treat the least is how you treat Jesus. Yep. I'm not better than you, so I may be le- le- less than you. But you can't even say hi to me. You have a lack of presence in the room. Your presence means you're felt. Some disciples I've never heard or how they're doing in ages. You know, in the, in the world, we have something called NPCs. Oh. <laughs> Are you a non-proachable Christian? NPC. Non-proachable Christian. You never look disciples in the eye. Well, you talk like this. Hey sis, hey sis, hey bro, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Oh. The eye is the lamp of the body. You're looking away because you're insecure. We share the same Holy Spirit. Oh, if you haven't, it's Holy Spirit inside of you. Or maybe the evil spirit is just afraid of looking at the Holy Spirit inside of me. That's why the demons in the Bible were like, oh no, we know you're Jesus. Is that the demon inside of you? Oh. Do we have presence like Jesus in a room? Or you're always on your phone. Wow. Do you believe in the great I am or you believe in the great iPhone? To give you security. Do you have commitment like Jesus? You can't pick and choose. What means you go to? I've never been to a church where disciples get to pick and choose their meetings all the time. 
I can't make Bible talk, but I can come to midweek. I can't come midweek, but I can come to Friday. You do realize in the Old Testament, they didn't even have Zoom. Are you a biblical Christian? Or are you a 21st century Christian? There's no 21st century Christian. You've added to the word of God. You've created a denomination. Partial committed disciples. I'm calling disciples to commit to every meeting of the body from today forward. I don't care if you have a family issue. I don't care. I'll be afraid. You're like, can I take a day off from heaven? This is rehearsal for heaven. You can't take a break from the kingdom of God. If you don't want to be here, leave. Don't be, we can't force you. My job is not to force you to heaven. You are standing on your own convictions. Do we address sin like Jesus? Do we disciple one another? Or do you just take it to your disciples, just disciple it? You're not a disciple. You're not. This is a hard teaching. Disciples disciple one another. Yeah. Ephesians 5, talk to one another, Psalms and hymns. Disciple one another. If you catch a brother in sin, a sister, in sin, call it out. Don't wait for the leader. We're leaving. Me and Novella and Johnny and Carmen. Oh, the leaders are gone. We can now talk to the disciple for ages now. Is that your convictions? Do we have the same convictions like Jesus? Are we like Jesus and looking to build the kingdom or to build an interest? Jesus grew up as a teen, so he perhaps got tempted to have a crush. People forget that. He grew up hitting puberty. He grew up having temptations. He probably was that lonely kid in the corner you never speak to. The Bible says he wasn't even attractive. The person that you probably won't share your faith with could have been like Jesus in his modern day. Yet these disciples were offended. In the scripture, those in the crowd wanted to follow Jesus to receive manna from heaven. Yet Jesus called them to eat the bread of life instead, which was Jesus. And these guys were Jews. You got to to think about it. These guys were Jewish. The disciples were Jewish. The reason why they may have responded this way is because they're so attached to their past. In the past, we got manna from heaven. In the past, are you in the past, disciples? Are you living in the past? Don't talk to me because I'm trying to get over my trust issues from the past. An abuser just came back, just reminded me of my past. You are not a disciple because you don't forgive quick. One thing that I'm learning in my marriage, we got to have a short term memory. If that's how you hold people in the world, you are not a disciple. If Jesus were to forgive you the way that you're holding this grudge against the abuser, would you want to save your soul? Would you be saved? Oh, just give me some time, just the process. Let me go to this therapist. Preach. Jesus' therapist was Jesus, was, was God, Come was the on. Father. No human can, can, can help define you better than the Lord God Almighty. Come on. Or is the Bible not your standard? I'm going to get into labels soon. Come on. Come on. They were so attached to their past. If you're stuck to the past just like these guys, the disciple says that even the scripture goes and say they left. They left. So if this, if, if this is offending you, go leave. Wow. We're here to multiply. Yeah. We're not here to multiply your sorrows into another guy Woo! or into another girl. Oh is that the conviction you're going to pass on to somebody else? Wow. Because of your issues, your problems. They couldn't get over the old way of doing things. The old way of you doing, you died to that. Romans 6 says you died. Stop trying to, research, stop trying to resuscitate your old corpse. Corpses stink. There's no pleasing aroma about you. Just dead in you. You're just dead in the congregation. I stood at the back today and the disciples were not singing. You mean to go to, I could go to every single one of you and say, bro, why are you not singing? Sis, what is going on? Why should I avoid all contact with, eye contact with me? Verse 61. Oh, Aware his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of life. No, they are full of the Spirit and life. Hope that describes you today. If there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. Wow. What does this highlight? Once saved, not always saved. He knew the disciples, the scriptures literally state, he knew who would betray him. Fire. Among his disciples. You could be a disciple today, but be betraying Jesus right now. Once saved, not always saved. Just because you have a conviction today doesn't mean you'll make it to heaven. Judas was surrounded by Jesus for three years. He had the perfect preacher, perfect teacher, but still went to hell. 
He wanted to say, uh, the scripture goes on to say, he wanted to say, this is why I told you no one has come to me unless the father has enabled them. From this time on, many disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You don't want to leave two now, do you? Jesus asked the 12. This, de- this was a D time. A discipling time with his disciples. He's like, you want to leave? I d- does this describe your D times? Sis, get over yourself. Do you want to leave? Bro, shut up. Shut that demon up. Get over it. Does this offend you? Does that describe your quiet times? Does that describe your D times? This is how Jesus spoke to his disciples. Why do we speak to one another as if we're going to get cancelled? Jesus had a heated D time with his, with his guys. He discipled it there and then. He didn't have a bitter attitude for a while and waiting to get open. He offended people. We live in a time where if you say something, you get cancelled. If Jesus was physically in this generation, most of you would probably cancel him. Jesus was ready to evangelize the world on his own. He said to his 12, you guys want to leave? I'll do it on my own. Are you willing to do that as disciples too? I'm ready for some of you guys to leave. I'm not here for numbers. I'm here to evangelize the world. If you're not here too, you can leave. You can leave. This is a hard teacher who can accept it. Jesus taught hard teachings regardless whether disciples agreed or not. I'm I'm not waiting for your agreement. He wasn't teaching or preaching for people's approval. Mm. Can you soften the message? I don't like what you said. Mm. What makes you, have you led a church before? Mm. Wow. Well, well, well. It doesn't mean that, they are, that the teachings are hard to understand. They're just hard to accept. Yeah. 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 Godly friendships is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Yeah. Singleness is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Yeah. Marriage is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Yeah. Discipleship is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Wow. You want to know the answer to that question? You accepted it. That's why you're here. You're either one of two people here today. You either accept the message or you don't. We live in a time where people want to preach a soft message. There's two ways to preach. Weak message or strong example. Or strong message and weak example. I'm preaching from a strong message but a weak example. As I preach a hard message to you, I'm preaching a hard message to myself. But as I preach, some may end up cancelling me by the end of the sermon. Yet it was the religious who cancelled Jesus. Am I okay to preach the word? But even if I don't, I'm gonna wait for your approval. Three simple teachings, three simple hard teachings for you to accept. Point number, well, I have three simple hard teachings. I'm not calling them points, I'm calling them hard teachings. Point, uh, one teaching number one. Hard teaching number one. Seek God while you can be found. No, seek God while he can be found rather. Seek God while he can be found. Turn your Bible to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Seek God while he can be found. Hard teaching number one. Seek God while he can be found. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Verse one. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. The scripture states, remember your creator. The scripture states, your creator, which means it's personal. Reminds me of the scripture in John 20, 28, where Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Do you take it personal when someone hurts your Lord and your God? Do you take it personal when someone misses the meetings of the body? You tell them, you hurt my God. You hurt my Lord. You missed your giving today. You hurt my God today. You're having a bitter attitude towards the Bible. You're hurting my God. Do you have that attitude towards God? I mean, towards your convictions. Reminds me of the time, again, with Joseph and with Potiphar's wife. He said he didn't want to hurt his friend, Potiphar, but he ultimately didn't want to sin against God. He was like, this is my personal relationship with God. Do you see when you don't seek God with all your heart, you hurt him? When you don't pray in the morning, you hurt him. You don't feel like praying. You have the tiniest quiet time ever. I feel guilty whenever the tiniest quiet times. 
Now, some days are going to be more challenging than others, but do you give your whole heart to that bite size? Could you preach a, a sermon from that one scripture? Because the scriptures are deep waters of inspiration. You should be able to preach it from your one scripture quiet time. That's still a great quiet time. Do you see when you don't put God first, you hurt him? The scripture says, remember your creator. It's a personal relationship. If you don't feel hurt, maybe he's not your Lord. When you miss giving, when you miss church, do you feel like oh, I hurt God today? Or do you feel guilty that oh, I feel bad for myself? That's worldly sorrow. You feel bad for yourself for making a mistake. But godly sorrow, you're, you feel bad you hurt God. Worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Do you treat God the same way you treat yourself? I just want to treat myself. I just want to chill. Do you treat God with that amount of love? Do we seek to please God the way we seek to please ourselves? For the sisters, I want to get my nails done, my hair's done, my hair done. But I don't want to, you know, get my relationship with God done. I want to continue being a victim. We need to seek to please God, not ourselves. You deny yourself for God, not for people. When you seek to please God, you do everything outward. It's not a natural thing to please God. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9 says, You may say, it's not who I am. But the world thrives off of this. I've suffered and I can't get over it. Well, write down the scripture, 2 Corinthians 5 9. You may say, it's not who you are. Seeking to please God. Because the world thrives off this. I've suffered and I can't get over it. So therefore, respect me for who I am. I'm oppressed. You don't know how bad I've had it. Therefore, respect my labels. Hey. Who you are is a result of the decisions you make. Just change your decisions. Yes. Do you do everything out of faith? The Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 6, it is impossible to please God without faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. Is that you today? Do you have faith today? Yes. Faith speaks. No, I said faith speaks. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9, so we make it our goal to please Him whether we're at home in the body or far away from it. Do we seek to please God? Again, it's not a natural thing. We conform to this pattern of it's just not who I am. Everything done without faith is sin. It's not a natural thing to have faith. That's why you get it from the Bible. Yes. Romans 14, 23 says, everything done without faith is sin. Back to the scripture in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. There is value in remembering God and eternity in your youth. Come on. The scripture says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Why in the days of your youth? You're easily influenced when you're younger. Yes. Wow. You're moldable. Yes. You know, at this very moment, you're the youngest you'll ever be. Yes. So the scripture says, remember God. Remember your creator now. No, remember your creator now because you're, you're the youngest you'll ever be at this very moment. The question is, what are you feeding yourself? What are you allowing yourself to be influenced by? What are we listening to? Who are we listening to? What are we allowing to influence us? What are we watching? We've allowed to be influenced so much in this generation. You know how? Infinite scrolling. We allow ourselves to get influenced. You're like, I just need just, just one more. Just one more. Just a few more minutes. Just five more minutes. Even to the point where we don't even want to wake up in the morning. We want to hit our alarm. That's influenced us so much. That's infinite scrolling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Because you're infinitely trying to go to bed. Come on. Wow. Come on. Come on. So good. Come on, bro. You know, the person who, who regrets, no, the, the person who invented infinite scrolling actually regrets it because of what it's done to mankind. And where do we find it? On our phones. The infinite scrolling is on our phones. It's called the idol in our pocket. You fear losing your phone more than you fear losing your convictions, as stated earlier. What's so valuable with your phone than your relationship with God? According to recent data, the average person spends three hours and 15 minutes on their phone each day, and one in five smartphone users spends upwards up to 4.5 hours on average on their phones every day. You know, I believe that one, that one thing that can expose a young person's convictions is their relationship with technology. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. One thing that can persuade the young people of today is technology. 
more than God. More than God. It's never been this easy to access pornography. In the Old Testament, there was never on phone pornography. There was brothels. You had to travel to a brothel to go see a prostitute. Now it's become so easy to access those brothels on your phone. Both men and female. It's never been this easy to become addicted. What's an addiction? The fact or condition of being addicted to a particular substance or activity. Synonyms for addiction, dependency. For men, an addiction can become women. You depend on them so much. That if you don't speak to them, it's called clinging in the world. If you don't speak to them, you get insecure. It can even seep into the church. If you don't speak to a particular brother or sister, you get insecure. It's not your job to check up on them. It's not. They got their disciple. You're not God. There's nothing you can say that can change them. Only the word of God can. Stop trying to act like God. And even the other way, women trying to find dependency on men. You're not going to find you're not going to find security in a relationship with a man because we're human, we're sinners. We're going to end up hurting you, you're going to hurt us back. Yep. Marriage is not going to fix everything. Yep. You know other other meanings of addiction, craving. You can't live without it. Habit, weakness, enslavement. And addiction is an enslavement. You become addicted to your phone. Addicted to the what the world says how relationships should be built. Are we addicted to technology more than sharing our faith? The Bible says, hold on to the teaching. Therefore, then you will know the truth and then it'll set you free. Not hold on to your phone. It says, hold on to the truth, then you'll be set free. No, it says, hold on to the teachings, then you'll know the truth and then the truth will set you free. But what people do, they'll hold on to that article they run on about online, about the church. They ho- get hold on to their doubts. They hold on to their insecurities. They hold on to their labels. They hold on to their phone. You ask a disciple to look at their phone. Some disciples are like, I don't want you to look at my phone. Why? What's there to hide? Mm. Come on, bro. Come on, call it out. Now, yes, we need to be men of the times that the men of Issachar to use our phones. But how are we using what we have? Again, the scripture says, hold on to the teachings. Then you'll know the truth and you'll be set free. Not hold on to your phone. Because then you'll always be enslaved. Because you won't know the truth. Because you're not holding to the teachings. Then you won't be set free. And you, therefore you'll always be addicted to your phone. Because you're not holding to the teachings of Jesus. Come on. Because we're in the world, not of the world. Yeah. Mm. We wouldn't see our need for our phones if we got our dopamine release from seeking God with all of our heart. Come on. Yes. Come on. Come on. That's it. And this is what's crazy. Happiness is a byproduct. Let me say it again. Happiness is a byproduct. Is. Yeah. Come on, bro. Yeah. You don't look for happiness in your quiet times. Yes. What people do, I don't have a feeling for my quiet time. I didn't have a good quiet time. Yeah, because you were seeking a feeling. Mm. Because it's a byproduct. If you saw God with all your heart, you would be happy. Yeah. I'd have a good quiet time because you didn't seek God with all your heart. Oh, come on. There's no feeling you're supposed to find. What are you looking for in your quiet time? An answer? You don't seek answers. You seek God. Then a byproduct is being blessed. If you're not happy today, it's because you didn't have a quiet time today. You got to seek to finish your quiet time with your whole heart. That's why you feel empty or stuck. Because you've been approaching your quiet times looking for happiness. Trying to find security in your quiet times. You don't find security in your quiet times. That means you're seeking quiet times. You're not seeking God. Solomon here extor- uh, exhorts the youth to remember God early, to gather the man in the morning. That's what we read the Bible in the morning. Yeah. Come on, and to do it while they're young, to present the first fruits to God. With those we study the Bible with, we make them into a disciple. We make them into a disciple. We always ask, are you seeking God with all your heart? But how come when we become a disciple, we stop asking if we seek God with all our heart? Just because you become a disciple doesn't mean you've mastered the art of seeking God with all your heart. That's why you be in Bible studies to remember what you did at first. Yeah. When you're not in Bible studies, you become entitled because you don't remember who you were. That's it. That's it. Come on, come on. Right. And too many occasions, we meet people onto the next study when we haven't even lived out the previous study. Right. I've heard people go online in darkness when they're not even reading their Bible. Yeah. When they haven't even shared their faith. Yeah. When, they're, when they haven't even set the Bible as their standard. Really? When they're not committed to the meanings of the body. Really? Why are you moving someone all the way to the church or the light and darkness study when they're not reading their Bible? 
It exposes your convictions because you don't seek God with all your heart. Because you don't find it offensive. Like, I didn't help my God and my creator, so I'm not going to check with this person. Come on, Joseph. Come on, Joseph. We help them to remember God in the days of their youth. That's pre-baptism. That's their youth. Their pre-baptism before they get baptized. We help them remember their creator. That's why no one can get baptized until they're actually living like a disciple. Come on. Who they are before they become a disciple is who they'll be after. Yeah. You're baptizing a disciple. Yeah. You're not baptizing a religious person. Yeah. Quick Bible studies, quick fall away. Yeah. You're trying to get people quick, quick baptism so you can quickly date, quickly break up, wow. quickly fall away, quickly get bitter, quick convictions. In the world, you call it a cookie. Oh. <laughs> you're just being wildly. If you want everything to be quick, you're just being wobbly. While we are young, we give all of our hearts to God. The scripture says, remember God in your youth. Give God the first and the best. Seek God while he can still be found. The scripture says in Isaiah 55 verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found, call on him while he is near. This is the time. God can be found now. Seek him now. Back to the verse in Ecclesiastes 12. It says, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. In the AMP version, it says, before the days of evil come or the years draw near, when you will say, of physical pleasures, I have no enjoyment and delight in them. We've got to seek God before we enslave ourselves to something we will eventually find no pleasure in. Because the scripture states, you've got to remember your creator before the days of trouble come and then you find no pleasure in the things you once had pleasure in. So seek God now. Find your pleasure in God now because the scripture states you're not going to find what you find pleasurable now later on in life. You're not going to be binging a whole series anymore. You're going to find that enjoyable when you're older. You can barely even stay up. Right. You know, I just want to pray at home just on my chair. Go out and walk. There's going to be a day where you're not able to walk. Yeah. It says remember God in your youth. Go to the gym while you're young. Yeah. Take care of your body while you're young. And amen, shout out to the, to the remnant and the oldest. Right? You guys are the youngest right now. Again, again, you're the youngest you'll ever be, so it still applies to you. Amen. Mamas and amen, family, amen. So the challenge is simple. Seek God while he can be found. Give him the best that you have. Seek God with all your heart. Because then one day you won't be able to. Heart teaching number two. Preach the word. Verse nine. Ecclesiastes 12, verse nine. The conclusion of the matter. Not only was this teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words. And what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study wearies the body and the church says. Yeah. So despite the fact, I know that may sound like, wow, that sounds like an apocalyptic literature. What does that mean? Right? But let me just break it down for you. Despite the fact that this teacher may have known everything. Who was the teacher most commonly known as Solomon? He got given, he got imparted knowledge by God himself. First Kings 3. He prayed for wisdom, got wisdom. Wow. Even queens travel. People travel to hear his wisdom. Wow. People travel to hear the word of God. So people, if you got disciples, you've got to be willing to travel. People yeah. are willing to travel for the Bible studies. Right. right? But despite the fact that he knew everything, he didn't keep it to himself. The scripture says he imparted knowledge onto other people. His search for knowledge didn't stop himself from teaching other people. Wow. So because you know the scriptures, why are you not teaching people? The wow. scripture states, if you know everything, go teach it. Yes. Go teach it. His search for knowledge didn't stop him teaching people. He didn't allow his own desires about knowing everything to outweigh the importance of teaching other people. The scripture states in verse 11, the words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails. Now, people probably don't know what a goad is, but a goad is basically known as, also known as an ox goad, right? Was a wooden rod with a sharp tip. So you've got like, like this, right? Was a wooden rod with a metal tip, which was used to keep cattle moving. So like, just like the horse, you have the, the little whip to get them faster. This is the thing to get the cattle going in the right direction. Right? Like an ox code, wise words or important truths might be unpleasant when first heard and applied, but can be essential for moving us in God's direction. 
So it may feel like the gold right now. You may feel like, ooh, this, ooh, this. Yes, that's the point. That's what the word of God does. It pricks at, it pricks at you. There's a phrase, we're poking the bear. We're poking you. If you feel poked, yeah, feel poked. Feel poked. So you go, go in the right direction. Amen? Amen. So what does that highlight? The right words have power. Because the scripture says he had wise words. He said the right things. Words are powerful. They have the power to inspire or manipulate. How are you using your words? Are we preaching the word? Are we preaching the word in D times? The Bible says we warn the idol, not encourage. I feel like we'd be, he, he's struggling right now. Let's just encourage him. No. The Bible says, warn the idol, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm not here to warn, I'm not here to encourage you. You've been idle for so long. The church has been idle for so long. I'm not here to encourage you guys. I'm warning you guys. Woo! Scripture says, warn the idol. Many of you have been idle for so long. I would single you guys out. Maybe I'll catch you guys in the fellowship, but I have not seen you grow in a year or two years or even three or even the time I've been in Birmingham. It says, warn the idol. Warn the idol. Warn the idol. I'm warning you guys. I'm scared some of you guys won't even make it. Do we disciple preaching the word? Or are we too afraid of being cancelled? Even by disciples. Come on. Some of you may be tempted to cancel me right now. Keep What's cancel culture? The practice or tendency of engaging in mass counseling as a way of expressing disapproval and exerting social pressure. You're collectively agreeing... I disagree with him, so let's cancel him. Again, some of you may be tempted to cancel me after this sermon. Yet they canceled Jesus. It was the religious who killed Jesus. But it should be us killing our sin. Not killing the preacher. Word that everyone uses today. Oh, sorry, I'm triggered. That triggered me. No, that triggered me. That triggered me. No, that's triggering. That's so triggering. I don't like it. Don't say that. That triggers me. Jesus triggered everyone. That's why on the day he died, they said, crucify him. He did nothing wrong. They just, they just got triggered. He knew she was innocent. They triggered him, then they killed him. I don't care if things trigger you. Be triggered. It's biblical. I'm poking you with the ox goad. You being triggered is not a me problem. That's not. I don't have an issue with that. It's a you problem. That's you deciding to succumb to the fact that you can't get over what happened to you. I'll get into that later. But are we afraid to call people to submit to the scriptures? Not to submit to their emotions? Or submit to their trauma? Or submit to their past? Even calling singles to singleness. Be single! Most of you deserve to be single. Most of you deserve it. Who wants to date a person who doesn't want to follow you? Even who wants to follow a brother who doesn't lead? Vice versa. Why are we afraid to call people to submit? The scripture says he who finds a wife, not he who finds an immature woman. Not he who finds a girlfriend. No. It says he who finds a wife. You know why I dated Novella? Because she acted like a wife. She acted married to God. Not dressing immodestly, showing all her body parts. She's like, no, I'm married to God first. I'm dressing modestly. You see her fashion right now? She's dressing like a wife. That's wifey material. So if you're like, why does no one want to date me? Because you're not a wife. You're not acting like a wife. Imagine having to, to, date, to, to marry a wife who just complains about everything. The Bible says, remember your leaders in uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Make it a joy for them, not a burden. Mm. You don't know, you're supposed to respect your husband. Right. Respect means you support them. Yeah. You, call, you help them when they're down. You know how many times wow. I felt down leading the church? But Novella's always been there. Oh you guys don't even see half the stuff. She's seen me cry so many times. Because I'm not comfortable showing in front of any of you guys because I feel like I would get cancelled. Can't find, like, the scriptures don't say find a sister. It says find a wife. Wow. Not find a sister who can't deal with their emotions. It says find a wife. Right. We gotta find you as a wife. Right. I'm talking to the sisters here. Right. Come on. 
The reason why I chose Nevada is because she was humble, she loved God, and she was submissive. Can a brother, can I speak to the sisters? Yes. Can a brother lead you without resistance? Without resistance. Without a critical eye. Because scripture states how you treat the least in Matthew 25 verse 40 is how you treat Jesus. If Jesus was one of the brothers in the congregation, sisters, and you gave him a bad attitude, heaven is not for you. How you treat the brothers is rehearsal, how are you going to treat Jesus? Because you're getting married to him. Yeah. Or this phrase, don't talk to me, I'm feeling a type of way. Don't talk to me. Don't touch me. I'm feeling a type of way. Ignores text. You know, you know what it's called? Manipulation. And lust for control. The scripture says you've got to deny yourself. Why are you telling me not to touch you? Deny yourself. Is your feeling more important than the word of God? Deny yourself, sis. Deny yourself, bro. What's wrong with you? You're entitled. Are you afraid? Oh, I'm going to get cancelled. Oh, I don't like you. Get out then. Does this offend you, sis? Does this offend you, bro? I'm not here for your mess. Because what ends up happening is you use your current sufferings and situation to be manipulative. To manipulate the feelings of others, to make them feel guilty that they don't know what to do with you. That's manipulation. To make them feel guilty for not knowing how to respond to your past or your condition. That's manipulation because you're controlling their response. You want to control them. You know the downfall of man is power, money, sex. You just want to manipulate them. You want to revolve them around your finger. That's control. You don't want to be led. You don't want to be controlled. Lord means controller. You don't want to submit to God. All authority is being given by God. As a man, I lead you as a sister. So if I say stop it, sis, let me hug you. It's not forced. It's not, being, it's not being soft. It's being called a disciple. Deny yourself. Yes. Bible says if literally one part of you is getting, like you'd rather cut your right arm off than get your whole body thrown into hell. Okay, I won't touch you. Okay, your whole body will be thrown into hell. The waters of hell can touch you. You'll always have stimulation there. You want to just hug a brother or hug a sister? What is that? What is that? Entitled. Manipulative. Using other wor words to make me submit to you. Using words to make us suffer to what the world says about you. Rather than what the Bible says about you. You're letting the world's diagnosis define you more than the word of God. I have this illness. I have this condition. Yes, that's what the world says. Who's the prince of this world? Satan. You care more about who you are in the world than you care about being a disciple. Come on. Come You're saying the world is your standard? What is that? Stop holding people responsible for your happiness to your condition. Stop holding people responsible for your happiness or your condition. That's not our fault. You gotta stop holding people responsible. Submit, you gotta stop submitting to what the world labels you as. And allow yourself to be labeled by what God says you are. The Bible says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Isn't that enough? Isn't that enough? We live in a time where people like oh when they have suffered or feel like they've been oppressed and refuse to submit, desire lost to self of control and say, respect me, that's just who I am. Mm. Eve gave value to the apple. Are you adding values to the label that, that the world has given you? Mm. Eve added value to the apple. The apple was already good. She's, it says when she saw it, she defined it as good. Are you defining what's, what, the label gives you, what the world gives you as a label and adding more value to it? You don't know how bad I've had it. My PTSD or my trauma. You're adding more power to your label. Mm, wow. Come on, preach. Is there power in having a label? Nope. That label will die with you. Yeah. You can't take it to heaven. As Callum Reed said, it will be too heavy. 
Maybe it might even drag you down to hell. Because again, it was the rich man. It was the label. It was his label. He got dragged him in hell. Wow. He was still the rich man in hell because he wow. still had his label. Come on. Rich. Are you adding to the value of your health issue? To the suffering that's happened to you? Self-diagnosis? I'm, I have anxiety or depression. You know that's thrown around so much in today's society? That's so true. Yeah. Passed around like it's a weakness or a disease. Mm. I feel like that's, that, that, that's passed more around the disease than the STD. I feel that's more of a deadly disease than an STD. Oh. I'm, and I have anxiety or depression. Who, who diagnosed you? Myself. <laughs> because now what's happening? It's seeping into the church. Right. <laughs> One person does it, then it spreads through the church like a wildfire, like a disease. Why? Because we're a body. One person's like, it's okay to me, for me to meet, miss meetings with the body because of my health. Yeah. So then other, another person says, oh, I can do that too. And then another, I can do that too. What is going on with the church? I thought you were called to be a disciple, yeah. not called to be oppressed by your label. Hey. Right. Now, I'm not undermining what's happened to you, okay? Don't get it twisted. It's not your fault, but it's your responsibility. Yeah. Right. My simple challenge, get over it. Come on. Just get over yourself. Yeah. Stop being a victim. Get over it, man. Get over it. Get over it, man. Get over yourself. Get, I'm, I want to hear some. I want to hear your life changing. Rather than you saying you're stuck in the same place. you stuck in the same place as no one's fault. It's you. Mm. Get over it. Get over it. Free. Get over yourself. Get over yourself. I'm talking to the disciples here. Yes. Get over yourself. Yes. Get over yourself. Yes. I remember being told that during the time I'm leaving the church, I may have signs of depression. I got told that. that oh, you may have depression. I literally was talking to a medical health expert. And when I got off the phone, I was like, yo, when I got off the phone, I was like, that is baloney. I'm not getting defined by who the world says I am. I'm not, I'm not depressed. I was just allowing the stress of the Satan to get to me. Yeah. Then Satan used that person to help get to me, to make me say I'm depressed. No, I'm not. I spoke to a doctor the other day. He says the only thing that requires medication for mental health is dementia and Parkinson's disease. Wow. Right. Nothing else. Right. Nothing else. Everything else is just a result of bad habits and debauchery. A lack of self-control. A lack of self-control. How do we know this? When you look at your screen, the idol in your pocket, the blue light imbalances your chemicals. So then you get your dopamine released from other things. That's why you don't go to God. You don't want to pray because you go on your phone the first thing. I can probably guarantee a lot of disciples go on their phone the first thing. That's why they're so depressed in the church. Because you go on your phone, you look at your phone like so many times because you're filling yourself with blue light. It's not a natural light. It imbalances your chemicals. Then we, then we try to take medication to try to get those chemicals back. All you just got to do is just change your habits. Yeah. Just put down your phone and pick up your Bible. Yeah. That's why Jesus, pick up your mat and walk. Yeah. Don't say pick up your phone and sit. Oh, come on. Pick up your mat. A result of these things is a lack of self-control. Right. Overeating is a lack of self-control. Right. Oversleeping is a lack of self-control. Right. Being overweight is a lack of self-control. Yeah. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. The Bible says it's a fruit of the Spirit. It's a fruit. Which means if you don't have self-control, you're not living by the Spirit. I'm scared that you don't even have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You can't even control yourself to come to church on time. You don't even have, you're not living by the Spirit. The Bible says the body is a temple, not a trash can. What are you feeding your body? It's a temple for the Holy Spirit. Would Jesus want to live in your body? Would he? Would he? Would he? Would he really? Would he really? What Satan wants us to do, he wants us to become paralyzed. It's called spiritual paralysis. All Satan has to do is attack the mind. Then he's paralyzed you from sharing your faith. Paralyzed you from having a quiet time. Praying or even just simply believing that you can overcome. A lot of us can find ourselves being too worldly. I'm not allowing what the world says about me to define who I am. I want you guys to repeat that after me. I'm not allowing what the world says about me to define who I am. Repeat after me. I'm not allowing what the world says about me to define who I am. I am not allowing what the world says about me 
to define who I am. Say it with conviction. I am not allowing what the world says about me to define who I am. We're ushering this out of the church. We're ushering this out. You're not being a victim. Get over it. Preach the word. The scripture states, hold on to the teachings of Jesus. Then you'll be set free. Not holding on to the labels the world has given you. Not holding on to the suffering. Not holding on to the oppression, the hurt, the trauma. They're all there to make you a victim. You still on to those? You still be enslaved. Because the truth will set you free, not those things. Genesis 27 verse 14, the NLT version says, When you decide to break free, you will shake his yoke from your neck. When you decide though. The scripture says, when you decide. So you won't be set free until you make a decision to become set free. You're actually stuck in that place because you're deciding to stay stuck in that place. You're not, you don't want to break free. When the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change, you'll change. Amen? Amen. Change is simple. Don't be defined by what the world labels you as. You're not a victim. Get over it. Amen. Verse 12. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study where is the body. The writing... What, what does this highlight? The writer cautions us to not believe everything we read. That's it. Nice. For all does not come from one shepherd, on. one yeah. standard, right. the Bible. So when we read the internet to define what the Bible says, oh. it's, it literally says, of many books there is no end. And, men, and, and, and literally much study wearies the body. When you keep searching online about the church, the ICC, this, 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 you're wearying your body. Right. You're wearying your body. Because it's not of the one standard. You're adding to the word. So why are you adding to the why are you adding to it? Don't add to it. Stop doing that. Because the Bible says that it, they don't come, it literally doesn't come from the one shepherd. It doesn't come from God. The internet is not God. When did the internet become more powerful than the word of God? The Bible is the truth. It will either be your standard or not. We can read all the books in the world and all about the different laws. But there's only one law we follow. It's the word of God. So I heard all these laws the other day, but the, like about people's like special like sayings of what this law is like one of them is Murphy's law and other laws they're cool but it's not the word of God right I'm not letting other stuff define what the word of God says the only law that will survive is the word of God so don't be going all by these perishable laws amen Amen. last hard teaching live every day like it's your last sub point let go and let God And I'm running over time here, but I think it's necessary for the church. Verse 13. Now all has been hurt. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of mankind. Verse 14. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Whether you do good or bad, it will be brought into the light. What you did and what you didn't do. So those who didn't do what they were supposed to do will feel insecure. But those who did what they were supposed to do will feel integral. Because it says every deed will come into the light. Every deed will be bring into judgment, brought into judgment. So what is the conclusion? You've got to live life as one preparing for judgment and eternity. In other words, live life in preparation for the latter. You're either preparing for heaven or preparing for hell. The scripture says, now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. You know what's powerful? After writing much of the book of Ecclesiastes from a common false circumstance, which is under the sun premise, which is what the, the, the Ecclesiastes use about. Basically, under the sun premise basically means not in heaven. It's on earth. Amen? Amen. Right? So us living in this circumstance, everything was written in the book of Ecclesiastes about life on earth, mm-hmm. essentially. Amen? Yeah. So when it says under the premise, it's talking about life on earth. Right? After Solomon wrote about all life on earth, about life on earth, he excluded everything about accountability with God. But now the conclusion of the matter was the first time he mentions a command. Out of the whole book of Ecclesiastes, this is the first command. And the only command that was used. So after highlighting, okay, this is what happens in the earth, everything is meaningless, okay. Now this is the only one command that matters. Because I know you guys want to overthink things, especially in Europe. I keep it simple. Fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his commandments. 
Because throughout the whole book, he doesn't include accountability of God. He doesn't. He said, live life. There's no accountability of God. Oh, like, what? I can drink? No. Read the whole book and it says you've got to live life in accountability to God. Right. What is the actual point of this book? It literally says, fear God and keep his commandments. Solomon came to understand that it was worth to obey God and disobedience, both please God and fulfilled man's destiny. You know, fearing God is a call that puts us in our place and all other fears, hopes, admirations in their place. Because when you fear God, it puts other fears in place. When you fear God first, right? Let me, let me say that again. Fearing God is a call that puts it, us in our place and all other fears, hopes, and admirations in their place. Because when you got your priorities straight, you know what to do. If the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 1 verse 7, it is also the end, the conclusion. So there's nothing without the fear of God. Wow. It's the beginning and the end. This is the only place, again, this is the only place in the book of Ecclesiastes where a command is mentioned of God. We are commanded to fear God. To fear God is the beginning of knowledge and to fear God is to love God. The last phrase in this scripture literally means, for this is the whole of man. Elsewhere in Ecclesiastes, however, the whole of man is a Hebrew idiom for every man. So this is the duty of every man and woman. This applies to everyone. It is everyone's responsibility to fear God and keep his commandments. Why? Because God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. Right? And this is impossible to say with an unearth circumstance. Yet it is the root reason why it is wise and good for man to fear God and keep his commandments. There is and will be an eternal accounting for everything that we do. This is the complete opposite of believing that all is vanity or meaningless. Because ironically, the Bible says everything is meaningless, but then everything means something as well at the same time. Yes. Right? Why? Because one man says this, if God cares as much as this, nothing can be pointless. Yes. Yeah. It means every... So the fact that it says everything is meaningless, but everything still has meaning, it still holds the same importance. Mm -hmm. How do we know? Because despite the fact that everything is meaningless, everything still matters. What you do and what you don't do still matters. Yeah. So don't live your life as if there's no purpose. Come on. Right. Throughout this book, the preacher carefully thought through and lived through a life commonly held, a, li a life lived without consideration of eternity and the eternal God. After all that, he comes to the conclusion and challenges all those who continue to hold to the circumstances he held through the most of the book. As Paul explains this, he put this into perspective in 2 Corinthians 4.17. I'll read it to you for time's sake. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So what's happening to you right now is only temporary. So the phase you're going through, feeling like you may be stuck, it's temporary. You can get out of it. You can, get over, you can overcome it. You can, love, you can love God with all your heart. You can love God with all your might, heart, soul and strength. This is only a phase. But what is it that we must do? Verse 18 of, of 2 Corinthians 5 says, So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. So what see, since what is seen is temporary, but what is seen is eternal. We don't see what God is doing in the background. Yeah. So what's happening to you is temporary. God, not allow, God didn't allow me to go to Mexico two weeks ago. But then I found out last Monday I'm going to Mexico. Mm. Why? I had to let go and let God. Once I let go, God did his thing. He's like, I'll let you. If I really want to use my, I'll let you go. And I, was doing, I wasn't loving God with all my heart. But he was like, I'll still answer your prayer. Because you let go and let God. Mm. Maybe because your prayers aren't being answered because you're not letting go and you're not letting God. You're trying to control everything. I had to submit. I sought God and I submitted. Submission is not something that's natural. It's taught to you. The Bible says in Hebrews 5 verse 7 that Jesus learned submission to the one he's saving. He, no, he, he was hurt because of his reverent submission. He learned submission. Submission is something that you learn. It's not natural. Right. Amen, sisters. Amen. Even the marriage had to be moved back. I had to be submitted to that. Why? Because God is sovereign. God was the, I, so why? Why did God delay the marriage? Because he found us a bigger venue. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I was praying. I was like, God, I want August 19th in a small venue. But God's like, no, I'll get you a bigger, bigger, better venue where you get everything, all the rooms, the car park, everything, plates, everything provided. But what you're going through is a phase. If you're stuck. God was there. God is there in your suffering. He's there in the boat with you, as Lavard said. He allowed it to happen. 
So why are you getting bitter in your situation? God allowed it to happen. Not your parents, not your abuser. God allowed it so you can be here. Do you have the heart of willing to save the person who abused you? Wow. If you find that hard, you're not a disciple. Because wow. you don't forgive quick. Right. And then verse 5, 1 in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, awaiting the new body. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we've grown longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. And the church says, Amen. So what does this highlight? There's one quote that I love that I found this week. What we do now echoes in eternity. Wow. So the question is, what are you going to do now? Because what you do now echoes in eternity. It's the power of now. Repent now. Yes. Just repent now. Absolutely. Answer that text message now. <laughs> do it now. Do you want to get well? Do it now. The criminal on the cross only had one conversation with Jesus. He didn't hesitate. He did it there and then. He was like, I'm doing this now. Right. Jesus had a personal Bible study on the cross. What about you? Wow. While Jesus was suffering, he had a personal Bible study. Wow. So why not go for your suffering? The best thing you could do is have a Bible study. Wow. Make a decision right now. Wow. The challenge is simple. Value every day like it's your last. Share your faith like it's the last time you share your faith. Have a prayer like it's your last prayer you'll have in your entire life. Have a quiet time like it's the last quiet time you have ever. Wow. Make a disciple like it's your last opportunity to make a disciple. Wow. Yes. Go to gym Come on. when you can. As if it's the last opportunity you can. Don't let that away your quiet time, amen? amen. Some people, I, there was one time in my discipleship where I allowed gym to be my God more than my relationship with God. I was looking wham or bigger, bulking, but I was looking tiny, malnourished spiritually. Because we're going to get new bodies in heaven anyway. Amen. doesn't give you an excuse to treat your bodies trash. Thank you. Thank you that. Reconcile with that person while you can. Because tomorrow you may not. You may lose your life today. Obviously, God forbid. Forgive them. Why are you waiting for so long? Give me time, time to heal from my past. Do it now. Get over yourself. Tell, them you're, tell, tell your family you love them. When was the last time you looked your dad and mom in the eye and said you love them? When was the last time? I, I guarantee you, some, so many of you haven't said it. It's very quiet here now. Mm. Rather than complaining about what they didn't do. Say, I love you. In their eyes. Like you mean it. Because one day, you'll be right. You won't be alive to do it. Live every day like it's your last because one day you'll be right. It will be your last. Mm. One day you won't be able to do that. This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Three hard teachings. Three hard teachings. You gotta live every day like it's your last. You gotta preach the word. And you gotta seek God where he can be found. I love you and to God be all the glory.